Uh, all right, so today we're going to start with, um, we're going to uh, do the same calculation that we did last time, but now we're going to do it for uh, particles of given spin, um, which is, goes on the name of polarized cross-section. Uh, so last time we summed over spins and we made use of the um, formulas for summations of the spins of uh, U's and V's. But today we're going to do a cal the same calculation for given spins. And then uh, we will use a symmetry called crossing symmetry to calculate some more um, processes. And then we'll formalize this crossing symmetry in terms of so-called Mandelstam variables. Right, so, <coughs> uh, so we have the same, the same uh, final diagram as before. Uh, let's say, so minus a plus, minus a plus, and this was, uh, how is it called? I think it's P, P prime, K, K prime. <coughs> and uh, and we'll, we'll use the ultra relativistic limit, N e goes to zero, but also N e goes to zero. Just for simplicity. Uh, and so, well, there are a couple of ways of calculating this process for given spin. So let's say S, S prime, R, R prime. Um, the one that I will use involves uh, still making use of the same summation formulas as we had last time. And in order to see how to, to do that, we make use of the fact that the gamma five matrix in the value representation was chosen so that we can construct from it a projector. So it was chosen such that it has this form, um, basically sigma three, the third Pauli matrix tensor product with the identity two by two, which means that um, I can consider the projectors P L P right being one, P left P right uh, being uh, plus and minus one plus minus gamma five over two. Projectors means things that are the identity only in um, sorry plus corresponds to this or so it's the identity only in uh, one half of the subspace. These are projectors, meaning applying them twice is the same as applying them once. They project into different subspaces, so the sum of them is the identity, and they're orthogonal. Next, um, <clears throat> we remember the fact that the spins, the way we define them, the indices S, um, refer to um, a given, um, to a given uh, subspace, one of these subspaces that is being projected. So, more precisely, it's not the spin, but actually the helicity, which is the projection of the spin onto the direction of the momentum. So, helicity, let's say, is sp. Sp. <coughs> 
Um, well, yeah, I mean, sometimes you find about this. In this case, take the value plus or minus. Yeah. Um, so, so plus or minus a half in this case corresponds to left and right for the helicity. And so, uh, what we will uh, try to do when we say to calculate the polarized cross section, we'll try to calculate uh, a cross section in which we have either only upper components or lower components. One more thing of use is to note that um, so if I have if I define something with only left that is upper components with 1 plus 1 of 5 over 2 of psi then its bar so 1 plus 1 of 5 over 2 of psi and its mean bar would be 1 plus gamma 5 over 2 psi dagger i gamma 0. And this is psi dagger 1 plus gamma 5 dagger over 2. Right? But gamma 5 dagger is gamma 5. And, but then when commuting past i gamma 0, 1 doesn't do anything, but gamma 5 anti commutes with gamma 0, so I get a minus sign in front of it when anti-commuting. So this is psi dagger i gamma 0, 1 minus gamma phi over 2. And this is psi bar. So I have that psi bar left uh, is psi bar. So I should say psi left bar is psi bar right component. So then, for instance, we'll have that u left bar is u bar right. <coughs> All right, so why did I write this? Because now that I want to uh, calculate the polarized cross section, I don't sum the spins anymore. And remember that. From last time, we had um, things like this, u bar, gamma mu, um, u, for instance. So we had some, some object like that. Um, and uh, um, or, well, let's actually, what we had was, I guess, v bar, v prime, yeah, sorry. It was, uh, yeah, this one was v bar, gamma uh, mu, u. And uh, more specifically, we would like to calculate for given spins, s and s prime. <coughs> and so we have this, this gamma mu in the middle. But uh, but this S and S primes corresponds to taking left and right. So let's say uh, these correspond to having here U um, right and here having V bar left, uh, V bar left, which is V right, everything bar. Okay. <coughs> So then delta SS prime would really correspond to both of them being right. Um, <clears throat> but the observation that we make is that since this is already uh, right, that is, um, if it's right, that means that P left U right is zero left being 1 plus gamma 5 over 2. So 
uh, and then also uh, p right, you right, it's just p right, this is already right, on minus ground pi over 2. So I, that means I can introduce for free a p right in here without any prejudice. So I write this as uh, v bar of p prime uh, gamma mu 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 u of p. Okay? Uh, and then, well, I mean, we can do the same thing as in here. We can switch 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 to the left, but when commuting plus gamma mu, gamma 5 changes sign, so it gets a plus. So this would be v bar of p prime 1 plus gamma 5 over 2 gamma mu u of p. And then this, as before, is equal to 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 v, everything bar. So this is, this is then, uh, you see, introducing this 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 basically selects the left part, uh, selects the right part both uh, in u and in v. Okay? Um, but then, uh, so, but then, now that I've introduced this, so for, for having uh, the right part in both u and v, this comes for free. But now that it's there, I can for free uh, sum over also the other components. When this is, this or this is left, uh, I will get zero because uh, so this p right acting on your right gives you right, but acting on your left gives zero. Right. So uh, now for free, I can add uh, the left components of u and v as well. Right. <clears throat> so what that. Does, uh, what does that amount to? So remember, these things uh, came with uh, spin, or rather helicity, um, indices, which selected left or right. But now, I see that by introducing this 1 minus gamma 5 over 2, which was for free, I can now sum over all spins, or all helicities, because the terms with the wrong helicities zero. So in the result, in my sum over, um, over the matrix element modulus squared, in the, sorry, in the matrix element modulus squared, I can now for free just sum over spins. Uh, but note that, that, for instance, this, this term corresponded to the initial spins. Before, when I consider the unpolarized cross-section, I averaged over it because I didn't measure the spin. But now it is different. Now this is just the sum of the spin, not the average, because from this sum only one term contributes. Right? Okay, so, so now I have sum of the spins of this d bar d prime gamma mu 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 absolute value squared. That is to say sum of the spins uh, v bar p prime gamma mu 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 mu of p times the complex conjugate which is u bar of p uh, gamma um, gamma mu, and I put gamma mu here, that's a mistake. Uh, yeah, gamma mu, uh, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2, 
d of t, t tau. Okay? And, uh, um, and then you can use the same uh, sum over the spins. The sum over the spins was sum SS prime u s of t u bar s of t equal to minus i t slash plus n. Uh, professor, this, this index mu isn't it free because of your considering one, one part of length? Like you're following one line of the whole diagram. Oh, oh, sorry. And there's other that compares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was the point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I wrote it wrongly. I mean, this would be this, but I don't have this. You're right. I have uh, this, this <laughs> multiplied with the thing with mu. The other thing with mu. So then indeed, this is mu and mu. All right, thank you. So it's in my, as in my notes. Um, well, the final result is this is wrong. Okay, so then um, I have some SS prime, also Vs of P, uh, P prime, let's say, V bar uh, S prime, uh, sorry, uh, S, yeah, sum over S, yeah, for myself, uh, V bar of P prime minus I P slash uh, minus N. <coughs> So, um, so then we get, uh, and uh, so, so as before, we, we have this sum with uh, v, with the v's, right? And then the sum with the u's. The sum with the u's is, is in the correct order. But some with the V's, I have to go past three, um, uh, three fermions. So I get a minus sign. And then V, V bar is uh, minus I P prime slash minus N. Then I have gamma mu, one minus gamma phi over two. Some u uh, u u bar is minus i p slash plus n. Then gamma nu one minus gamma phi over two, and that's a trace because the indices are contracted in the end. Um, <clears throat> okay. And uh, well, in here. Um, Uh, let me see, okay, slash gamma nu. Yeah. So in here, uh, I I now I now switch um, Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I also have uh, this would be an E, but as I said, we're in the ultra-relativistic limit. So this is minus trace, and e goes to zero. So this is minus trace um, Extra minus, so <laughs> never mind. Uh, it would be minus i from here, minus i from here. So this is a minus, so this minus would be plus. It's different from my notes, but anyway, it doesn't matter because I'll get this sign twice, I guess. Um, so uh, then we have here uh, p prime slash gamma mu, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2, p slash. Gamma nu, one minus gamma phi over two. And now we do the same thing. This is a gamma matrix, and when one minus gamma phi goes past the gamma matrix, it becomes one plus gamma phi. But I have actually two gamma matrices. So when going past the 
two of them, nothing happens. And then I get this uh, p uh, right squared, but p right squared is equal to p right. So on all this is trace p slash gamma mu, p slash gamma mu, 1 minus gamma phi over 2. <coughs> Uh, all right, so with respect to the previous lecture, we have this first term is the same. So the only new term is, the only new thing is that now I have this projector, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. So I have 1 half the previous result minus the result with an extra gamma 5. All right, so the result is, um, and remember here I have so the first term would be a trace of four gamma matrices and trace gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma rho, gamma sigma is four g mu nu g rho sigma minus g mu rho so one three g mu sigma plus one four Sigma G rho. <coughs> uh, so this first term is four. Let me put also the one half in front. And then uh, I have this contracted with P mu, uh, sorry, P prime mu, P uh, rho. Right. So uh, four over two times um, p mu. Oh, sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I I wrote it like this, but uh, with three indices mu and mu, this would be p prime rho gamma rho, and this would be p sigma gamma sigma. Anyway, the point is now the first term is a contraction of 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is p prime mu p uh, sigma. The second term is a contraction of 1, 3, and 2, 4. So p p prime g, uh, not sigma, mu. Um, G mu nu. And the, the, the final term is 1, 4, 2, 3. So that's P prime nu, P nu. <coughs> so that's, that's the term that we had before. But now we have minus the, um, the 4 gammas with gamma 5. Trace gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma rho, gamma sigma, gamma phi. And that we said was epsilon mu nu rho sigma um, with uh, with minus i. Coefficient right? will be minus i. Let me see. And gamma 5 is minus i times gamma z. Yeah. So this would be minus i epsilon uh, mu nu. Well, uh, let me put them in order. So rho mu sigma nu contracted with p prime rho p sigma. Okay. So we get that the sum is equal to twice times P mu U prime mu plus P mu U prime mu minus pp prime 
de mu uh, minus i epsilon rho mu sigma nu p prime rho p nu okay <coughs> and then uh, the next term that we had will also be the sum over the spins but now uh, u bar of k gamma mu with the insertion of the same p right p uh, of k prime um, all right why why is the two multiplying the, the last term with the i'm sorry oh uh, yeah, yeah, no, this is, the, this is times the same, right? Because this was times the identity. Oh, okay. And then trace gives one. Trace of one gives four. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, this, we have this times uh, V bar k prime gamma nu 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 u of k it's not exactly modulo squared as was pointed out it's actually this uh, and then this is equal to uh, yeah, so now the same thing v v bar but then to have u u bar and an extra minus sign, so minus uh, <coughs> trace, um, so u u bar would be, uh, u u bar would be minus i k slash, uh, minus i k slash um, plus n. Then gamma mu, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Then uh, sum of dv bar is minus i k prime slash minus m. Then gamma mu, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. And as before, this, this is m mu, but this is also considered to be 0. And then minus i squared gives a minus, with a minus gives plus. As I said, we get two minus signs, so that doesn't matter. Some, um, sum over SS prime. Sorry, here, here we have. There's no sums now anymore. And uh, trace uh, k slash gamma nu, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2, gamma nu, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. Uh, wait, where did I put uh, here? k prime slash. And again, 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 going past two gammas doesn't do anything. And then uh, I have this p right squared, which gives p right. So the result is plus trace k slash gamma nu k prime slash gamma nu 1 minus gamma 5 over 2, <coughs> which is the same. Uh, the same thing as before with different momenta, so this is 2 times um, times k mu k prime mu plus k mu k prime mu minus k k prime mu 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 and finally minus i epsilon rho mu sigma mu k rho k prime sigma. All right. 
So, finally, we get that the modulus square, square of the amplitude for E minus right, E plus left, going to mu naught minus right, mu plus left. <coughs> the convention here is that, well, I, I, I just erased this, but uh, I had written that psi bar left, uh, sorry, sorry, psi left bar was equal to psi bar uh, right. Um, so, uh, so in this case, we had the one minus gamma phi over two. Um, um, so we we yeah we we had psi bar right and then psi uh, um, Well, anyway, the point is that uh, yeah, so this is right. The electron is is right. Is u uh, u right? But then this is uh, v uh, v right bar, which is V bar left, I guess. Well, I get myself confused, but anyway. Um, so this this absolute value squared of n is sum of the spins absolute value m. So now I have. Um, no left and right in here, I just have uh, all possibilities. And then this in turn is the product of the two factors that we wrote. So this is 4 times uh, the first factor was um, so p, p mu p prime mu plus p mu p prime mu minus p p prime g mu nu minus i epsilon rho mu sigma nu p prime rho p sigma and the second fact factor is k mu k prime nu plus k mu k prime nu minus k k prime g mu nu minus i epsilon rho mu sigma nu k rho k prime sigma so, oh, this multiplied by e four over q four. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So this is uh, still multiplied by e four over q four. <coughs> Let me write it here. Then. So this is four e four over q four. Times what? <coughs> well, uh, so this gives p k p prime k prime uh, twice, and then the cross terms give p k prime uh, p prime k. So two p k p prime k prime plus p k prime prime k. So this is um, this times this. Then this times this gives um, this times gives this gives two p prime k k prime is a minus. And this times this gives the same. So minus four. Uh, 
PP prime KK prime. Uh, then this term is symmetric in mu, but this is anti-symmetric, so this doesn't contribute. But actually, all of these things, so all of these things are symmetric. So this is symmetric in mu, this is symmetric in mu, and here is anti-symmetric in mu. So this times this gives nothing, and also this times this gives nothing. So the epsilon only contributes with it when applied with itself. Minus i times minus i gives minus, then the two epsilon multiplied. So minus epsilon rho mu sigma mu uh, p prime rho p sigma epsilon rho prime mu sigma prime mu k rho prime k prime sigma prime. But then this product we have said is equal to 2 um, delta um, rho rho prime delta sigma sigma prime minus delta rho sigma delta rho prime sigma prime and, uh, and so this last term then gives um, minus uh, minus 2 uh, this rho rho prime is uh, p prime k p prime k uh, p k prime um, then minus um, rho sigma Uh, no, not rho sigma prime. Rho sigma prime times rho prime sigma. Uh, rho sigma prime is p prime k prime minus p prime k prime p k. Okay, so the result is then 4 e4 four t4. Four. And I can take also another factor of 2 common. Uh, yeah. So 4 times 2 is 8. And then, um, let's see. Uh, P, K, P prime, K prime comes with a plus 1 here. Plus another 1 here is 2. P, K, P prime, K prime. Uh, but then these terms cancel. So P prime, K, K prime, K prime K uh, cancels with this one. And then from here we get minus 2 P P prime K K prime. Let's see, did I get the right? So this is 16 E4 over Q4. No, I uh, did something wrong. I don't have this term. Why don't I have this term? It's bizarre.
Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody follows this. <laughs> Somebody should have pointed out. So I did. I do have this times this plus this times this, but I also have this times this. Right? This times this gives PP prime KK prime times minus minus plus G mu nu G mu nu is 4. Right? So this is plus 4 PP prime KK prime. So this cancels. Alright? I don't have this anymore. So 16 E4 Q4 PK P prime K prime. Okay. <coughs> All right, uh, and then um, we also know from last time that q squared is minus 4 e squared. Uh, this is basically in the center of mass. I don't have momentum; I only have energy, and the center of mass energy is 2e. So q squared is minus 4 e squared. And uh, but then we also see that saw that p dot k is equal to um, sorry p. Uh, oh, the other thing is I get the Robin contraction. Uh, just a moment. So I get the wrong. Oh, sorry. Yes. Again, epsilon times epsilon from last time is actually minus two times this because I do the the, the minus comes because the basic element here is. Epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3, epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3, which is equal to minus 1 because the 0 is up and down in the 2. So here I have plus, which means that what cancels is the second term. So this, this one cancels with this one, but the first term adds up. So, uh, sorry. No, the, what cancels the first term in here with the second term in here and then these ter terms remain then pk prime is equal to p prime k uh, and that was equal to minus e e plus k plus theta from last time and so E squared e plus k plus theta squared divided by q to the 4, which is 16 e 4. So this is e 4. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm using the ultra relativistic limit. this and then the differential cross section in the center of mass is m squared over 64 pi squared e center of mass squared uh, so d sigma d omega in this case d minus right e plus left minus right and plus left is equal to um, well yeah if then e squared over four pi squared 
uh, sorry, e squared over 4 pi is uh, equal to alpha, and then here I have e to the 4 was 64, which is 4 times 16, 5 squared. So I have alpha squared over 4 to the center of mass squared times 1 plus cos theta squared. All right, so this, this was the um, matrix element for one kind of, uh, for one kind of uh, scattering. For e minus right, e plus left, e plus e minus right, e plus left. But now, um, Uh, now we can uh, calculate other kind of scattering. So we can switch, for instance, here left to this right, because these was these were uh, independent lines. Right. So. so before we've considered uh, e minus right, e plus left which amounted to introducing the projector 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 in here. And in here the same, mu minus right, mu plus left, which amounted to introducing the projector 1 minus gamma 5 over 2. But, um, but these two, uh, as we saw, the traces of these two lines were independent. We calculated the sums of the spins independently for the for the initial spins and for the final spins, right? Um, so, so now I can, uh, well, think of the same calculation, but I just switch in here, I switch the, um, I switch the helicity of both spins, which amounts to just using the other projector, 1 plus gamma 5 over 2 instead of 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 in the upper, Fermion um, uh, sum of the spins. All right. And 1 plus gamma 5 over 2, you remember, uh, mm, let's see. Yeah, this was it, right? This was K and K prime. 1 plus gamma 5 over 2, K. So if I put here 1 plus, gamma 5 over 2. This is, this is the second sum that I've been writing here. Now, these first three terms were for the trace uh, without gamma 5, which is the same. And then the trace with gamma 5 switches sides. So I just put plus in here in front of the epsilon term. Right? But the first trace remains the same. So in this case, uh, I just put a plus in here, right? So again, only the epsilon term uh, gets uh, gets a difference, a different sign, and so I get uh, a plus in the epsilon epsilon term, which is a plus in here. So uh, what that hap what that means, as we saw, is that uh, I switch um, yeah, this was supposed to be an exercise. I just saw it now. <laughs> Never mind. You'll forget about this. <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, the result is that uh, well, I did it almost. <laughs> There's still some details left. Um, but uh, then this minus left and cross right, this amounts to just switching the sign. All right?
and also in the ultra relativistic case, one can do the full calculation, but it's a bit more long. Um, and, and then similarly, we can calculate these other ones, p e minus left, p e plus right, going to uh, mu minus right, mu plus left. Okay, and well, uh, it's kind of clear. So for this one, for this one, I I have uh, I have the different uh, the exact opposite to this one. Sign. So I have one plus gamma five over two in the in the initial ones. And uh, one minus gamma five over two in the final ones, but the result is the same because well, I I switch I switch a minus sign uh, in the second term instead of the first, but the result is the same. So so this is the same as this one, alpha squared over four minus sine over mass. One plus cos uh, sorry one minus cos theta squared, and then d sigma d omega center mass m squared goes to zero for d minus left d plus right going to d minus left d plus right. So this is switching the compared to the initial calculation, switching the the spins of all the particles. But then it's clear that I get minus signs in both uh, both terms. So then I'm back to the, the same as being two plus sign. So I'm back to the original one. And this is alpha squared over four e central mass squared one plus cos theta squared. Right. So all of these possibilities are the only. So th these are the only non-zero possibilities. And uh, so, yeah, these are the corresponding polarized cross sections. So, you know that we have uh, different realities in the initial and final part. Right, right. This was what this is what I said. So, what you call this left and right is uh, is a convention, right? But uh, my point my point was that I started by saying that if I have this projector. I define the projected for the yeah for the fermion, not for the antifermion. So uh, this means I have the projector p left one plus gamma five over two. So if I introduce this projector, then this also projects into onto this. Okay. So so that's the only non-zero because otherwise, if I put another combination, so. So calling this right is a is a convention. Whether whether I call uh, because I, I said that for instance c left bar is c bar right. So it kind of depends on your convention. But people usually call use the convention where the antiparticle has opposite spin as well to the part. Right. So. For example, it's better to understand with an example. If the uh, left one was left, couldn't the, the positron be left also? No, that's what I said. I just told you the first thing I started with was to show that if I have this projector that projects this into onto left, then that automatically projects this onto well, what I call right. Okay, so you would yeah. end up with two projectors in different sort of spaces. Anyway, yeah, so I, I started with this, so I, I wrote this formula. So this is a project acting on this, but then this was the same as 1 minus 1 5 over 2 
V, everything bar, long yang, U. Okay? So the projector acting on this is the same as. <coughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so, so the cal you see, the calculation that I did was using the same formulas for the sums of the spins. And the way I did this was by putting an explicit projector, and then I can, uh, I can sum of the spins. But there's another way to calculate the same thing, which is found in Passion and Strasler, for instance, which is just to write down the explicit forms of u and v's in the um, uh, uh, in the center of mass and ultra relativistic. So this other possibility would be to write well, write u of p is equal to square root minus p c max psi square root minus p sigma bar psi. Um, uh, so this, in this case, would be, um, th this object would be square root e plus p, uh, e plus p in the third direction, that is to say. So I'm, I, I align the momentum in the third direction just to easy and then uh, this amounts to 1 minus sigma 3 over 2 and uh, um, one plus the same thing with a minus p3 but 1 plus sigma 3 over 2 this thing acting on psi, and then uh, in the lower case I have p dot sigma bar, and that amounts to just switching the signs um, in the second term. So I, I, I don't intend to prove this. You could you could prove this relation explicitly by, but so try to to think about uh, what this means more specifically. So this is. Per root uh, square root p zero minus p three sigma three, and then see that you can rewrite it like this, and then this is square root p zero plus p three sigma three. See that you can rewrite it like this, and then in the ultra relativistic case. Can only do this Sigma yeah, that's right. Uh, in the ultra relativistic case, E equal to P, P3, so this becomes square root 2E, uh, 1 half, 1 plus P hat, that is the, the direction of the spin, but sigma, um, psi, and here 1 half, 1 minus P hat, that's sigma psi. And then V similarly becomes, so V has uh, a minus sign in here. And so this becomes the same thing with a minus sign. So you, you write this and then with these explicit U's and V's, you can try to calculate it. But that sounds to me, I don't know, it's unelegant to me, and so I much prefer this other way of calculating. Uh, all right. So let's now move to a different topic. Now that we've calculated this matrix elements, let's consider crossing symmetry.
So what is crossing symmetry? Well, you see we have this Feynman diagram, but well, I put I put in here minus e plus and minus mu plus. But you see, if I didn't put this, you even sometimes ask me for things like this. How how do I know where the, where is the initial and what, what's the final state? Right. So in the convention in here was that time went this way, so it means that this amounted to a collision of plus and minus in creation in plus and minus. But I could rotate this diagram on another way of saying it is considered time, for instance, going this way. And then this diagram looks as if it's a, uh, yeah, well, I suppose, um, I suppose it's better to, to, to do it this way. No, wait. <laughs> no, I just put these things wrong. Uh, wait. How is it? Yeah, I put things wrong there. <laughs> I should have I should have uh, written it like this. So then this would be minus and plus but um, but now if I put time going this way, you see if I if time goes this way, then what happens is instead of this instead of being a mu plus now it's a mu minus, right? And this is a mu plus. And then I have a collision of minus with mu minus into the same. Because now this is also changed. Instead of e plus, now it becomes uh, e minus. So by rotating by 90 degrees, I have uh, e plus e minus going to e plus e minus uh, becomes E minus mu minus going to E minus mu minus. Okay? So I have this. And as I said, for time going this way, I would have E minus E plus going to e plus e minus but then for time going this way I have e minus e minus e minus e minus right okay uh, so you see that this relation acting on the Feynman diagram is a simple transformation um, so, action on Feynman diagrams, it's called crossing. Um, and then we find that we can also act on momenta. So, we act on particles. Right? We saw that instead of e plus and mu plus, in here, after the crossing, I have e minus e minus. And uh, also, we act on momentum, because, well, you see, in this way, I, I have momentum like this, right? But in this other way, I, I keep this momentum, but then it goes this way goes this way. So, well, I can also say what the action is on momenta. I switch, as you can see, I switch the sign of the momenta for the same particles for which I switch the um, particle to antiparticle. Okay? So, uh, acting on momenta itself, that means I act on the amplitude. And 
uh, if I get that if the amplitude is the same, that's a big if. Then we say we have crossing symmetry. In general, will not. In general, acting with this crossing on m will get a different, uh, different m. M will be changed. But if by chance I, I get the same m, then I call this a crossing symmetry. All right. Uh, so, so let me let me now rewrite this. In the, in the same form with the time going upwards. So let's say that the cross diagram then, where we're still time still going upwards, is this. And uh, we call this P1. Um, this is mu minus with momentum P2. And then this is P1 prime, the same mu minus. This is the same mu minus with P2 prime. This is Q. OK. <coughs> All right. So. The unpolarized cross section one fourth sums over the spins of m squared would be well e four over four q four um, and. Uh, I mean, we can perhaps see that this is uh, this is so, but let me let me write the result in here anyway, and then we'll try to explain it. Gamma mu minus I P one prime slash plus M P mu. So what happened with respect to the previous case? Well, in the previous case, we had um, um, uh, let's see which ones were. Which ones were the these? Ah, let me let me look in here again. So this was uh, P P prime. Well, P P prime, which now become. P1, P1 prime. And this was K, sorry. 
this was uh, k, k prime, which now become uh, p2, p2 prime. <coughs> and then in here we had v, we had a v for this one, v of p prime, which is p1 prime now. So before we had minus in here, and here we had a v in this one, which is uh, k prime that now becomes p2 prime. So in here we had a minus. Okay, so this is what we had before. We had minus signs in here because these were sums, uh, these were sums of these. Okay, and now the difference is that now these are um, these are uh, u's. All of them are u's. All of them are particles now. They're not any particles anymore. So this is u bar u, this, this line is u bar u, this line is also u bar u. <coughs> so now all of them are, uh, all of the things are u, so the only thing that, the only completeness relation I, I have is some of the spins u, u bar, which is minus i p slash plus i. That's why I have plus m everywhere. Right? But you see, I have this in, in two places. And so, equivalently, I can take out the, these minus signs and cancel it, and effectively then uh, rewrite this as minus with a minus. So, Professor, I'm lost because all of them are mass of the electron because you have some mean. Oh, sorry, mass of the mean, yeah, yeah. Because I, I thought. Uh, well, yeah, 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 sure. Sure, sure. The second is the, the second is for the muons. P two P two prime is uh, muons, right? Thank you. <coughs> uh, right. So, so now I've written this way with yellow, which is which keeps the sign in here from one the from the. the the original amplitude before the crossing, but switches the sign of the momentum, right? So this is equal to the previous m, but with uh, um, with so p1 going to p1, but p1 prime going to minus p1 prime, and p2. Uh, well, I mean, k to p2 prime, but uh, k prime to minus p2. Right? So, uh, yeah, so this amplitude squared, some of these things. Okay? So uh, the effect of the crossing was to switch the signs of the uh, momenta corresponding to the antiparticles that became particles. Okay, so then we can immediately write down what the result is. And here, uh, this is 8E4. Well, I had somewhere, but I erased it. Um, the, the formula for for this result in terms of p, p prime, k, k prime. And I just to introduce this switch. And then I get p1, p2 prime, p1 prime, p2, plus p1, p2, p1 prime, p2 prime, plus m mu squared, p1, p1 prime. OK. Um, 
but now in order to write this in terms of um, in terms of momenta and energies, we have to write down what happens. So if I have this being the electron and this being the muon, then I have a momentum P1 that corresponds to an energy K and a momentum K also in the z direction because the electron is massless. I mean, ultra relativistic. And then this P2 for the muon must have, well, an energy but the opposite momentum. The energy is greater than K because this is not massless. And then, uh, let's say this is the muon and this is the electron. So then there's a deflection angle theta and uh, then P1 prime, the energy is conserved, so I have the same energy for both, but the momentum then is conserved only in, uh, in absolute value but not in direction, so this is K and some other K, and here is the opposite. Uh, all right, and then we also have that the center of mass energy is e plus k, and let's say various invariants. Let me write them here. these things are minus P1, P2, the energies are E and K, and then uh, the product of the momenta is, uh, oh, yeah, with uh, minus, and then the product of momenta is minus K squared, and this is minus K, E plus K, then P1 prime P2 is uh, P1 P2 prime and P1 prime P2 the product of energy is again EK and of momenta is minus K squared cos theta minus EK minus K squared cos theta minus K plus K plus theta and P1, P1 prime is equal to P1, P1 prime, product of energy is K squared, and of momenta is K squared cos theta, so minus K squared plus K squared cos theta, that's minus K squared one minus cos theta, and Q squared, so this is P1 plus P2, uh, well, uh, no, P1 minus P2 squared with this um, notation. No, sorry. No, no, it's. Uh, no, sorry, uh, for this diagram. Q is equal to uh, P1 minus P1 prime squared, sorry. But, uh, but one corresponds to the electron, which is approximately massless. That means P1 squared and P1 prime squared are both zero. And this is minus two P1 P1 prime. So two K squared one minus cos theta. Uh, so then let's write what we have in here. So 8e to the 4 over q4, that's 4k4. Uh, um, 
4 k4, 1 minus cos theta squared. Then p1 p2 prime times p1 prime p2. Is this thing squared? So k squared k plus e cos theta squared. Then this one squared, so plus k squared e plus k squared. Uh, plus m mu squared p1 p1 prime is minus k squared minus k squared minus cos theta. Um, and I see that I can take out also k squared. Then we get this result. And this sigma d omega is m squared of 64 pi squared center of mass energy squared. <coughs> uh, so this is, I have 2e4 over k squared common factor. And then divided by 64 pi squared. Um, so e4 over 16 pi squared is alpha squared. And in the denominator, I'm left with um, 2. So alpha squared over 2k squared e center of mass squared. But, uh, but e center of mass was e plus k. So e plus k squared times, uh, and then I still have 1 minus cos theta squared times this bracket over here. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and then we can also take the ultra relativistic limit, in which case E becomes K, and then this becomes <coughs> Let me call this still um, E center of mass, so 2 E center of mass squared, and then k squared in here will cancel the k squared coming from everywhere in here. So k is equal to e now. Um, and this term goes away. So um, get 1 over 1 minus cos theta squared, uh, 1 plus cos theta squared plus uh, 2, 4, sorry. Yeah. And uh, the thing that I want to note is that when theta goes to 0, well, this thing becomes 4 plus 4. So that's 8 divided by 2 is 4. 4 alpha squared over E center of mass squared. But here, 1 minus cos theta becomes theta squared over 2. Uh, so, the non 16, here 1 over theta to the 4. So, this blows up as 1 over theta to the 4. That's kind of divergent, very divergent. Um, and uh, I mean this is a divergence that's associated with the cross section sigma because sigma would be an integral over d theta 
of this term that looks like 1 over theta to the 4. So that's still infinite at 0. Um, but uh, you see, one of the points was that um, I considered m, uh, the mass of the electron and the muon to go to 0. If I didn't, then I would not have this divergence. So this is something related to, um, to low energies or low and low masses. These are what are called infrared uh, divergences that appear when it's scatter massless particles. These infrared divergences will be addressed in quantum field theory too, if and when that that is. Hopefully, I should be teaching next semester. I, I put it as my, as my preference, but I don't know. Um, so then, to, to complete this analysis, we now know the general uh, picture for crossing, which I, I sketched in this case. So crossing then amounts to taking the amplitude for some particle that I call phi with momentum p. And then becomes what? Well, first of all, you saw that in order to cross it, I had to go to take the particle from the initial state to the final state. Right? So, five. But then, when I did that, it amounted to taking the particle to an antiparticle. Right? This is what I did here. So, this, when considering the difference between time going upwards and time going to the right, this particle became an antiparticle. So this, first of all, it went from the final state to the initial state, then from particle to an antiparticle, so phi to phi bar. And finally, we saw that in, the, in, the, uh, in M, this amounted to taking its momentum to be minus P minus the initial momentum. Okay, so this is the uh, this is crossing symmetry. So by crossing I should say by crossing I do this. But not all the particles No, not for all of the particles. For some of the particles, right? Yeah. This and this in this case. So these were remain invariant and these not. So is it just a computation so, so 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 by the way that means that I can do this. Uh, you see in it, I, I I stated I stated this um, crossing in this particular case as an action that as a rotation of the diagram, but that doesn't need to be doesn't need to be just a rotation of the diagram. I can literally just do this, right? Just switch some of the particles around like this. And it can be any particle, any combination of particles. That's why I say this. This is the more general case. I, I just take one, two, three, four, even four particles, how many particles I want, and I do to them this transformation, right? And that's the crossing. Across a crossing of this, the corresponding scattering. You can cross in different ways the same diagram. Yes. Now it depends. Yeah. No, no. So there, there are two points. There are two points. As I said, as I said, this this is just a transformation on the amplitude. This is an identity. Okay, this is an identity called crossing. I just transform this amplitude into another amplitude where I exchange a few things, and then this is just an identity. Okay? Now crossing symmetry on the other hand is that when you do this, I mean this is some functional form of, of Lorentz invariance. We'll get later into that, but 
Lorentz invariants are called STN. This is a functional form of these large invariants. Now, the, after crossing, this is a different, a priori different functional form of STNU that amounts to some, per, some action on these STNUs. If it's the same functional form, then we have, say we have crossing symmetry. If not, it's just the crossed amplitude. Uh, but, but, but then uh, M is not equal to M. No, this it should be like an M prime or something. Should it be? No, that's why I put K. Oh, and okay. Then, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other observation is that uh, since k is equal to minus p, you see that means that k zero in particular is minus p zero, and so I cannot have both. Uh, I cannot have k zero positive and p zero positive. So that means that this crossing takes a real particle to. Uh, a virtual part. So in order to, so, so crossing takes a real particle to a virtual particle. So strictly speaking, in term, if I want to consider a scattering of real particles, the final step is an analytic continuation in energy from negative to positive. So final step. analytical continuation in energy okay, from a virtual to a real plane ok so uh, so I just promised you something that I do have to write this in terms of large variables from minus some variables so let's do that so cross Yeah, yeah. Cross, crossing is just a uh, transformation. Crossing symmetry is a symmetry. Yeah, so why there's an equal sign? Uh, Again, this is the same. This when you has to change the equation, but, but in this equation, I change k to minus p. So this will be a function of s, t, and u. Then this will be a function of, say, t, s, and u. You know? Numerically, they are the same, but functionally, they are different function forms. This is a numerical, like 1.2 equal to 1.2. That's what I mean by this. But these are different functions, right? Uh, all right. Um, yeah. So let's see. So Mandel's Mandel's some variables. Professor, I still uh, about this part of symmetry. Uh, symmetry in physics, as I mean, symmetry of the action has a. No, no. This is not symmetry of the action. This is symmetry. Yeah, yeah. That's of that's. Um, I'm gonna not come to this one, but it's important uh, in in modern physics much because. Of the other theory, right? Because you have, we can associate some uh, conservative quantity. Yeah, yeah, this is, well, this is, is crossing symmetry is more, more, one more complicated symmetry. So, what is associated with there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a discussion. So, so. Um, well, let me, let me come back to that after I say about man's own variables because then you'll see something. Uh, that I want to, to talk about. I'll, I'll come back to this. Okay. Um, so, the Ramsam variables refers to the 2 to 2 process, 2 to 2 scattering, where I, let's say, like here, we have P, P prime going to K, K prime. And uh, for this, we define. S as minus e plus e prime squared. And then by momentum conservation, this has to be equal to also k plus k prime squared. Minus k plus k prime squared. And you see, if I'm in center of mass, uh, in the center of mass frame, then the total momentum is zero. 
which is p plus p prime. So I'm so this is equal in fact to the center of mass energy squared. Okay. So this is the Lorentzian variant. Then t is defined as minus k minus p squared. And then again by momentum, trans uh, momentum transformation, this is equal to minus k prime minus p prime squared. Okay. And so what is this? Well, if if the particle p and k refer to the same particle, meaning they have the same mass, then um, and then in this case we are talking about elastic scattering. Right? We have particles that just scatter elastically, like the Coulomb interaction or Yukawa interaction or something. Uh, then that means that by energy momentum conservation, the energy of this one is equal to the energy of this one, which means this one contributes only in terms of the momentum transfer. So P is equal to then minus K vector minus P vector squared. So this is momentum transfer. So P is a measure of the transfer of momentum between particles. And finally, the last one is called U. That's uh, minus K prime minus P squared. That is minus K minus P squared. So, uh, so let's let's write uh, an amplitude let's write an amplitude then uh, let's consider the same e plus e minus going to mu plus mu minus. And in this case, <laughs> uh, S is minus P plus P prime squared, but P prime is equal to this Q. Right? So this is minus Q squared. And then T was equal to minus K minus P squared. Now it's not the same particle, so it doesn't have this interpretation as momentum transfer. But it's almost. So K minus P squared. Um, and then this is, and also minus k prime minus p prime squared. And from this one, uh, well, um, yeah, OK, so we can consider also the ultra relativistic case. And uh, in this case, k squared and p squared are approximately equal to 0. So this is equal to 2 uh, kp and also to 2 k prime p prime. Then 
u is equal to minus, <coughs> uh, let's say, 1 minus 3, so p minus k prime, and also 2 minus 4, so k minus, uh, sorry, 1 minus 4 or 2 minus 3, so minus k minus uh, p prime squared. Then by the same token, this is 2p dot k prime, 2p prime dot k. <clears throat> and then, well, we have this expression in terms of these invariants, q squared and these four things, for, for one quarter sum of the spins m squared. And uh, well, one thing we had here q fourth now becomes s squared. And, uh, and then we had these guys and these guys as products. So we had, I guess, uh, this times this uh, plus this times this. And so now that becomes s over 2 squared plus plus uh, u over 2 squared. Sorry, uh, t over 2 squared plus u over 2 squared. OK? All right. Now, uh, let's consider the sketching. Um, The, 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 the cross process. So the cross process was um, well, the cross process was this one, right? C minus minus minus. Then the e minus had the same momentum p. Um, and the mu minus, the final uh, mu minus are the same momentum k prime, but uh, so, so these were conserved. Yeah. But uh, well, sorry. Actually considered here like this. So in my notes, I put I put this, which is technically not what we did before. Before we consider momentum of of mu minus to be uh, k, not k prime, but whatever. I'll I'll consider. Um, I'll consider this the original. Uh, diagram, and then uh, so then that means that uh, mu minus is invariant. E minus and mu minus are invariant. This has momentum p. This has momentum k prime. But uh, e plus is turned. The initially e plus is turned to final e minus. So then uh, the momentum here is minus p prime, and uh, the final mu plus is turned to an initial mu minus, so the momentum k turns to minus k. Okay, so after the change, so for this one we have s that I'll call s bar, s of the cross diagram, s bar is minus. Uh, p plus this, which is minus k squared, right? Uh, 
And then, but then p minus k squared, you see, this is t. And then t bar is uh, minus uh, the change between these two. So before it was k minus p. Now it is minus p prime uh, minus p squared. So minus p plus p prime squared. But this was s. So t bar is s. And u bar is minus uh, 1 minus 4. So p minus k prime squared. But these are both invariants. They uh, both uh, remain the same. Right? Uh, so this is the same as u. Okay, so you see, for the cross diagram, I basically just exchange t with s. s bar is t and t bar is s, and u is invariant. So that means that for the cross process, so for the cross process. That means I can write immediately this. I just exchange uh, S15 the formula. So this is here it used to be S, now it's T. Now instead of T, I put S over T squared plus U over T squared. And as you can see, the formula is not. Uh, <coughs> is not identical. So now exchanging S with T, get a different functional form. Right? So, but what we did was just to make this substitution. Right? So numerically they're the same, but by substituting this in terms of S and T, we get a different functional form. So, so this, so means that this scattering is not crossing symmetric. All right, so now let me come back to the question about what does crossing symmetry mean? What could it mean? Well, that's a actually very powerful question. Uh, and people have, have asked this into the 60s. So they wanted uh, they wanted to find some um, they want to find some amplitude that was crossing symmetric, and uh, so there was, there was this um, this program uh, called the Bootstrap that now it's getting. Uh, uh, be in fashion again with, with some updates. Uh, Pedro Vieira is working on that in particular. Um, so this this uh, in the sixties people thought that by imposing some conditions on the amplitude you can uniquely determine um, the form of the amplitudes and uh, and get everything. Some quantum, they want to define quantum field theory not by Lagrangians but by imposing uh, some properties of the amplitude and uniquely finding a result. So then um, this program, this bootstrap program, uh, involved in particular of uh, people thought, well, crossing symmetry sounds like an interesting thing to impose. So what do you get? And it turns out that what you get is actually string theory. <laughs> so a crossing symmetric uh, amplitude is found in string theory. And um, uh, but so people try to impose lots of conditions on this amplitude, and they found uh, what they originally called dual models that then uh, turned out to be basically versions of what you get in string theory. It's not quite li like that. There's 
many things involved, but uh, the corresponding theory that at some point uh, became known as Regia theory, um, after one of the people most involved, other people were, uh, other important people were Steve Chu and uh, Mandelson. Um, so, so these, um, uh, these constraints looked very much like constraints that you get from string theory. But uh, eventually people gave up because they didn't really know what, what that meant because you impose a bunch of stuff and then you get your string theory, but you know, you're talking about QCD, which is really not string theory, so people were, were confused what, uh, what all this means. Um, I mean, now there's an update in that, but, uh, anyway, the, the story is still confusing. <laughs> Uh, so, the point is that crossing symmetric um, amplitudes are actually very rare. So what, what can happen is that it's symmetric under a particular crossing. So like this one, you can see, well, write it uh, originally, in the original form, you could see that it's symmetric under the crossing of U with T. And you can find a crossing that corresponds to exchanging U and T. Right? But it's not completely crossing symmetric. Not all crossings give the same result. Which I'm also saying that this is still a function that's not symmetric completely in ST and U. Okay? So, uh, fully symmetric uh, amplitudes are extremely rare. And uh, other than string theory, I actually don't know another example. I'm not sure if there exists. Um, <coughs> is there a reason that we should expect some amplitude to be crossing symmetric? Yeah. Well, I mean, not really, but uh, Does it keep something? well, there were yeah. The short answer is not really no. Um, but people were were studying the possible properties. What kind of things can happen at the crossing? to the amplitude, when you think about analyticity and so on. And then, um, and then one particular subset that arose was this imposing crossing Yeah, you're right, there's no fundamental need for it. Uh, so under, under certain crossings, you expect symmetry, but not, uh, not in general. So we don't have like a conservative quantity that has in that comparison that I was making with uh, action symmetries uh, that you can think as a principle of physics that no that's the point that then that's the point of this bootstrap that it has no no the only principles involved are are properties of the amplitude unitarity um, holomorphicity and so on. Analyticity, I should say, and so on. Um, and uh, but there's no. I mean, the, the, that was the beauty of this because people were thinking, and now it seems like with certain updates you can get closer to that. That you can actually get all possible quantum field theories this way. So then, obviously, you cannot restrict. Well, you restrict other things, like if you say. Well, the system has to have, I don't know, Z4 symmetry or whatever, then, uh, then that kind of more defines your, your theory and you, you are in a smaller subset. But uh, just from properties of, uh, from gener general properties of the, um, like crossing symmetry, you cannot uh, really, um, restrict that much. All right, uh, let me, let me um, note one thing that, uh, so I said, I said that these things are Lorentz invariant, but uh, how many Lorentz invariants do we have? Well, it turns out that for two to two scattering, there are two Lorentz invariants, two independent. 
lines and lines. Uh, and we can see this easily. So we have four momenta. But uh, each one has three components because they're related by uh, e squared equal to d squared plus m squared. So there are three independent components, so a total of 12, uh, 12 uh, objects, 12 components. But out of these, we have four conservation laws for energy and spatial momentum. So that gives eight. And then we can do a Lorentz uh, transformation, that is to say change frame, change reference frame. And how many of these are there? Are? Well, you can say in lambda, which is four by four, this is anti-symmetric, so there are six components. Another way of saying it is there are three independent rotations around three axes and three boosts. Uh, so there are six uh, Lorentz transformations. So eight minus six gives me two Lorentz invariants that I can make out of the four momenta. But here I wrote three. I wrote S, G, and U. And then that means obviously they are not independent. Um, and Could you repeat the last argument to go from A to 2? So there are six Lorentz transformations I can make. Lambda, lambda minimum is an anti-symmetric matrix, 4x4, four four, for has six components. But physically there are three rotations around the three coordinates and three boosts. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, generators, whatever. Yeah, I mean, the generator is the corresponding parameters of lambda. Yeah. <clears throat> um, right, so, so S and T and U are not independent. And let's write then the um, relation between them. So, in fact, S plus T and plus U is a constant. And let's write this. So this is p plus p prime squared. Uh, then k minus p squared and k minus p prime squared. Or k power. Um, so then this is minus p squared minus p prime squared minus 2 p p prime minus p squared minus y squared. Um, plus 2kp minus k prime squared minus p squared plus p, k prime p. Uh, three here, and yeah, that's it. Um, <coughs> And then we have this thing, so minus 2 p dot um, p prime plus k plus k prime. But by momentum for conservation, this is equal to minus p. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, the signs were wrong, uh, just a moment. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like this. P plus P prime is equal to K plus K prime. No, then it's minus P plus P prime is K minus K, K plus K. Um, so then this is 2P squared, but then I have minus 3P squared. Okay. All these things cancels against the 3. And I'm left with minus. Uh, p prime squared minus k squared minus k prime squared. Okay, so this is the sum of all the masses. All right. 
So um, S plus T plus U is the sum of all the masses. And then the order of electricity case is 0. All right. Um, So in the case of these uh, two to two uh, particles and the single exchange, so for three diagrams of this type, we talk about channels. And you know, this doesn't need to be that doesn't need to be uh, a final diagram. You can think of this as some um, physical particle. In fact, going back to the bootstrap, that's how people think of this as exchanging some physical particle in here, some renormalized particle if you want. Um, so some effective diagram like this. But if I consider such an effective diagram, in this case, I have P, P prime, K, K prime. And let's say here I have this exchanged particle, phi. Again, can be a uh, particle in the, in the Lagrangian or some effective particles. Then we talk about channels. So we, um, so you see the momentum here is T plus T prime. So that means that this thing, so the amplitude for this thing has the propagator that is 1 over the momentum, right, plus m phi squared. So there's a part with the fermions, but then there's certainly the propagator that has this behavior. But then this is equal to minus s. So this is minus 1 over s minus m phi squared, right? So you see that the amplitude is proportional to this pole in S, 1 over S minus n phi squared in this case. So then we call this the S channel. Um, but now let's consider the crossed uh, diagram. I guess I should have called this k bar, which was equal to minus p prime. And this p bar prime which is equal to minus k. Right? Then m in here is equal to 1 over. So here now this is phi. And so now q is equal to. Uh, uh, is equal to k bar minus p. This is proportional to so k bar minus p uh, is what we call minus, I mean, k bar minus p squared is what we call minus t, t bar if you want. So, uh, so this amplitude now is proportional to 1 over t minus m phi squared. Then we call this the T channel. Okay. And finally, uh, yeah, I mean, 
well, okay, I, I hope it's, it's clear. In the, in the notes I put k and p because really that's, that's how you consider this as some blob in here in which comes p and p prime and gets out k and k prime. Uh, and the point is if the, what happens is the particle goes upwards like this, then this is an S channel. If it goes this way, it's a P channel. But then the other possibility is the one that I obtained by, uh, uh, by let's say, switching this, these lines in the final state. So having this. this I have P and P prime and K and K prime um, well. Let me not put bars because then it becomes unclear which is, which one I crossed. So it, it is, uh, we can think of uh, crossing this original diagram, um, but uh, so I cross this one into this one, and I cross uh, this one into this one, right? That's, that's how I uh, obtain this channel. But, uh, but keeping the same notation, EP prime, AK prime, this amplitude, it's again uh, proportional to this propagator for phi, but now the momentum Q in here is K prime minus P. So this is 1 over K prime minus P squared plus M phi squared. <clears throat> but this is minus u. So this is proportional to 1 over u minus m phi squared. Okay, so this is called then the u channel. All right. Um, Okay, so now that we've defined these things, let me finally write differential cross sections. And specifically, given that we've just defined some relativistic invariants, let's write the relativistic invariant formula in terms of these invariants. Um, so now we can define d sigma dt that is that looks uh, relativistically invariant, and then uh, so p was minus p minus uh, p prime. Well. So p minus k squared. I have a typo here. Um, I shouldn't have erased this, but uh, anyway, we had um, p, which was equal to e and p center of mass and z, and p prime. Um, um,
<coughs> so this uh, t is equal to, if it's the same particle, then um, the energy is the same because then the energy is conserved for the same particle in the collision. Um, and then this becomes minus p minus k squared, the spatial momenta. That is to say uh, minus, minus uh, p, uh, p central mass, central mass p center mass squared minus k center mass squared minus 2k center mass p center mass cos theta. Alright? So that means that dt to d cos theta is equal to minus 2 or yeah, minus 2 k central mass, p central mass. And uh, forgetting, forgetting the minus sign, which is a convention anyway, um, what we had before was d sigma d omega. But d omega is d phi. Uh, no, actually, the sign also works. So I can write this as minus d cos theta. So it's d phi times minus d cos theta, which is sine theta d theta, right? <coughs> and if I integrate over um, the angle phi, which of which on which nothing depends, <coughs> this is two pi. So this becomes d sigma over two pi d uh, minus d cos theta. So that's um, d sigma dt times dt over 2 pi minus d cos theta. And this thing then is 1 over pi k central mass p central mass. Okay? <coughs> and then we remember that we defined a relativistically invariant formula, which, as I said, is a theoretical concept that equals the sigma of the omega only in the two relevant frames, the center of mass frame and the lab frame, where one particle, initial particle, is at rest. Um, so, the relativistically invariant formula was written like this, 1 over square root p1, p2 squared minus m1 squared m2 squared. Then k center of mass over 16, 64 pi squared e center of mass squared times m squared. Uh, <coughs> and now, so we need to, to calculate this thing and s. Um, so. Minus, well, let's call them p1 plus p2 squared. Um, minus p1 squared minus p2 squared minus 2 p1 p2. This is m1 squared and 2 squared. Uh, and then uh, that means that. P1 dot P2 squared minus M1 squared minus M2 squared, which is what appears in here, is equal to uh, um, sorry, no, this is uh, times M2 squared. Well, so this one means that. 
P1, P2 is equal to um, S minus M1 squared minus M2 squared over minus 2. So this is then S minus M1 squared minus M2 squared squared over 4 <coughs> minus M1 squared M2 squared. <coughs> um, and then in the center of mass frame, uh, in the center of mass frame, we also have p1, p2 squared minus m1 squared m2 squared is equal to uh, p1, p2 is e1 well, minus e1, e2. Then uh, Um, the momentum is T center of mass for this one and then minus T center of mass for the one other one. So P1, P2 is minus um, P center of mass squared. And this is squared minus M1 squared M2 squared. Uh, um, and um, um, ba -ba -ba. wait, how did I rewrite this? Getting myself confused. Now, S is uh, E center of mass squared, which is equal to E1 plus E2 squared. Uh, Then this is E1 squared E2 squared. Okay, this is uh, P center of mass squared plus M1 squared. This is P center of mass squared plus M2 squared. And uh, so I get P center of mass 4. With this one, gets a 2 P center of mass 4. Then M1 squared and M2 squared cancel to this. And I get, I'm left with P center of mass squared times M1 squared plus M2 squared. Then from here also plus 2 um, E1, E2. And, from and that's it. Well, and I can put this as well. And plus 2 P center of mass squared. Um, And uh, um, yeah, and moreover, then I can 
can say that this S is equal to uh, so I can I can use this formula. So this is m1 squared plus m2 squared. So then minus 2p1 p2 is plus 2 p1 p2 minus p center of mass squared. Minus 2 p center of mass squared. Right? No, plus 2 because the momenta p1 p2 have opposite directions. Uh, all right, so in here then we note exactly this combination S. So this is P center of mass squared times S. So in the center of mass frame, uh, we have that this square root becomes square root P center of mass squared S. So then finally, we have that d sigma dt was equal to d sigma dt uh, um, oh sorry this was k central mass k central mass of the phi so reverting this sigma dt is pi over k center of mass p center of mass times this sigma d omega. And this sigma d omega is one over this square root, which we've calculated as p center of mass square root s. Um, Well, I guess I wanted to write it the other way around. Um, I wanted to write k center of mass k center of mass as Sorry, I have, uh, I have still um, k center of mass times k center of mass over 64 pi squared times e center of mass squared, which is s. Then 1 over this square root and m absolute value squared. E center of mass cancels, and uh, for some reason, Oh yeah, there's no square here. Sorry. So here I have square root s. E center of mass is square root s. Okay, so <coughs> so in the center of mass frame we have this thing, but remember that our uh, generalization was actually based on the center of mass frame. And in the center of mass frame, I can, moreover, write this p center of mass square root s as the same square root. So in the center of mass, I can write moreover m squared over uh, 64 pi times this relativistic invariant. Uh, 
and now this is uh, this is a, a relativistic uh, invariant relation. <clears throat> and uh, well, I note that p1, p2 is also equal to this thing. So if I if I uh, substitute this in here. N, in principle, can be written as a function of S and T. So you see that we'll have d sigma dt as a function of S and T. So this is n of S and T squared of the 64 pi times this um, S minus m1 squared minus m2 squared squared over 4 minus and one squared and two squared, right? So this is a function of S and T, and here we have an integration of a T. So I can write the total uh, cross section as a function of S as integral. So this is a function of S and T, d sigma of S and T dt times dt. Okay. So this is the theoretically uh, interesting way of calculating. You calculate the cross-section, differential cross-section as a differential with respect to t, and then that's a function of s and t, and integrated gives a total cross-section as a function of s. s is center of mass energy squared, so this has a physical meaning, but only in the center of mass. However, the point is that now uh, this is a function of uh, two variables that can be analytically continued to the complex plane. And uh, that was the, the starting point of the bootstrap method that I mentioned. Considering uh, amplitudes in the complex plane and trying to see their properties. Um, yeah. All right, so this is everything I wanted to tell you today. All right, do you have any questions? Yeah, I was thinking if you have a that this process mentioned, you rotate it, for example, say, in the second order, then you, you add a little bit of the so. no, That's the point, that, yes, that yes, is, yes, it, yes. amplitudes are not crossing symmetric, as you saw. It's, it's, a, it's, it's it, 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 it's um, uh, sorry, uh, the final diagrams are not cross symmetric. Amplitudes could be, but yeah, final yeah. diagrams are not. As you saw, explicitly they are not. And that was part of the puzzle that I said uh, people uh, had in the 60s with this crossing symmetry. That a priori, so the point is, I showed you also that these. ST and U channels. So all of these, if you think of diagrams or even well, normal theories, they would would all have channels, meaning the amplitude will, will have some pole in S or in T or in U. Right? But then how can it be crossing symmetric? That's the question that one should ask. And there's one exercise that's related to that. How can it be? If you, if you can have a pole, and then the pole depends on the channel, how can it be dependent on the channel? The, the, the exercise shows you what the answer is. Cross the diagram isn't cross the amplitude. Well, an amplitude is not necessarily from one diagram only, right? That's the point. As I said, you can think of uh, particle, effective particle being exchanged, which means some renormalization and so on. Right? Yeah, so that's, that's part, of the, part of the answer. But do the exercise, we'll see. All right. Good. So, there's no more. Please give me exercise and I'll see you on